Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Brian. I am one of the curators here at Science World in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I wanted to begin by acknowledging that Science World is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. That's the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh in the village site of Sinoc. And we're very grateful to be able to work and play in this beautiful area. We have some amazing guests joining us for today's event. We encourage you to interact with us by adding questions and comments in the chat on the side of the YouTube there. Uh, we ask you keep your comments relevant to what is being discussed and leave space for everyone to participate. Uh, our technician today is Madeline. She's going to be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation. And she can also help if there's any uh, difficulties hearing or seeing things, we can try and sort out some of the technical things. Today's event is highlighting some of the themes of our new Backyard Adventures Gallery. This is an exhibition we have on display here at Science World in Vancouver. Uh, and some of the themes we like to encourage people to take away from that is that science is everywhere. Everyone can be a scientist out in your backyard. But it doesn't have to happen in a lab. When you look around, look at new things you've seen. Look at things you wonder about. Ask those questions and be a scientist in your own neighborhood. Uh, a backyard can be many things too. When I was growing up, we lived in a house and we had 10 acres of backyard. There were pastures, there were forests. I now live in an apartment. So my backyard is the whole neighborhood. I get to go to parks, I get to walk down trails. And as you do these things, you're part of a community. Backyards like those are shared spaces where everyone can explore. I'd be curious to know, and you can add this in the chat, what kind of things do you see in your backyard or your neighborhood? Are you in an area where there's beaches? Are there areas with lots of trees? Uh, is there particular wildlife that you get to see out there when you go exploring? Use this opportunity to think, observe, predict, and ask questions, because that's what science is all about. We would like to thank Audlem Brown, who is our supporter for these presentations, and they're very grateful for their ability to help us bring in these wonderful presenters. Today, we are looking at creatures that you might see in your backyard or your neighborhood that are sometimes viewed as being a little bit scary. Uh, we have experts on bees and bats. We may have other creatures to show you. In fact, another thing I would love to see in the chat, if there's any creature that you've ever seen when you're out exploring, maybe things that uh, you were first a little bit nervous around, and maybe you've learned a little bit more. But if there's a particular animal or creature or bug or thing out there, We'd love to hear the things you've been exploring with. Right now, I wanted to introduce our first guest. Uh, he is a seasoned beekeeper who works in urban beekeeping with a group called Hives for Humanity. Uh, he also manages our observation hive. If you've been to Science World, you'll know that we have a beehive here where we have uh, actual live bees you can check out. So he keeps them all wonderful and helpful for us. Uh, please welcome Phil LaFlame. Hey, Phil. Hi, Brian. Thank you. Great to have you here. So you're going to tell us a little bit about bees today. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the topic is taking a closer look at animals in your backyard that might be scary. So what I'd like to concentrate on first is the actual um, honeybee uh, and the colony, uh, how honeybees are different from other bees, uh, how members of the honeybee colony, uh, the members of the honeybee colony and, and what their roles are. Uh, the forage, so that's what they need to survive, how they communicate. And at the very end, we might, we'll touch upon that scary part, the fact that uh, they do have stingers. Um, now, honeybees, it, honeybees are just one species of, uh, uh, among many species of bees. In fact, in British Columbia, we have over 500 species of bees. And honeybees aren't native to British Columbia. They're not native to this hemisphere. They're actually brought over by settlers when they first came to North and South America as part of their livestock uh, because they wanted a source of honey and they knew that, uh, that bees would provide that. Honeybees are a social insect. They live in a colony. And you can consider it sort of a, a super organism. Think of it as the colony of bees as just sort of one individual. So Madeline, if you could bring up that slide, the first slide that shows the uh, different types of bees in a hive. That's the one, okay. 
So inside of a hive, we have what, what are known as uh, uh, cast members, the three different types of bees. Uh, now, in one colony in the summertime, at its peak in July, you may have 50 to 60,000 bees in a hive. Now, most of those bees are the, would be the, the bee you see on the bottom. That's a worker. And they're well named because they do most of the work in the hive. They forage for nectar and pollen. They look after the young. They clean the cells. They make wax. Um, they have a lifespan in the summertime of about uh, maybe a month because of all the work they're doing. In the winter, they live longer. They're physiologically different in the winter, and they can live five or six months. Uh, they're all females. They're sterile females because they haven't um, uh, they haven't mated. Uh, and they have, uh, they have stingers, and they're barbed stingers. Uh, <clears throat> the next one up is, is the queen. Uh, there's usually just one in the hive, and she's the reproductive in the hive, so she has mated. Uh, she mates once in her life with as many as 15 to 20 drones. She mates outside the hive, and she stores the sperm in her body for her entire life. She has a stinger too, but it's not barbed like the worker stinger. And the one on top is the, is the drone. And you may have four or 500 drones in a colony in the summertime. Uh, they're males, they don't have stingers. They have very big eyes so that they can see the, a virgin queen on a mating flight. Um, they really don't do any work in the hive. They're, they're fed by the workers. Uh, they fly out in the afternoons on nice days looking for a virgin queen to mate with. So they're only produced, uh, they start to, the colony starts to produce them in the springtime when they have excess pollen. And they'll be around the hive all summer. And then in the fall, when their work is done, because there won't be any virgin queens in the wintertime, they're actually uh, escorted out of the hive. They're dragged out of the hive by the workers and they're not allowed back in because they can't afford to have, have them in the wintertime because they really don't, uh, uh, don't serve any purpose. Um, the drones in the summertime may live a month. Uh, now the queen, I don't know if I mentioned this, but she can live anywhere from one to five years. And again, the workers, their length of uh, their lifetime depends on, on the time of the year. Now, um, as far as seeing these in your backyard, it's actually a good insect to observe in your backyard because they're quite common. Uh, they're more common now than they used to be because most municipalities changed their bylaws in the last dec decade or so to allow uh, beehives in, uh, in urban areas. So in Vancouver, for example, you can have two beehives in a backyard. So if you see honeybees in your backyard, there's a good chance they came from a hive in your area. Uh, the bees will forage two to three kilometers from their from their nest, looking looking for uh, for nectar and pollen. The pollen they gather from flowers um, that's their protein, so they feed that to the young bees. The nectar is their carbohydrate; that's their fuel source, and it's also they store it for the winter so they can uh, survive during those cold months when there's uh, uh, nothing else to eat. So as an example, in your backyard in the springtime, you might have dandelions uh, in your lawn. Uh, later on, you might have clover. Um, you could have fruit trees or, or, or blackberries or nut trees or uh, an ornamental <clears throat> flower garden or even in your vegetable garden. And some of these uh, plants will produce flowers that are attractive to bees. They'll be producing nectar and pollen. And it's the way uh, for those plants to actually reproduce. They'll have an insect come and visit them. They'll transfer the pollen from the male to the reproduce. Some plants are wind pollinated, but certain plants have developed this association with insects uh, and the insects do the work of, of pollinating for them. Uh, so if you see that bee in the springtime on a, on, a, uh, on a dandelion, it's probably come within a couple kilometers. Uh, it's looking for something to eat it'll land on the dandelion. Uh, in the case of dandelions, they'll collect both nectar and pollen. And that worker bee goes back to its hive. And uh, the amazing thing that I find is they're able to uh, actually communicate with the other bees in the hive uh, and tell them where that source was. So they'll do something called a bee dance or a waggle dance. They're doing this in the dark on the face of the comb. And they have certain motions they do. It's almost like a figure eight. And as they're doing this, they'll waggle their bum 
and uh, a certain number of times and they'll go in certain directions and there are bees that are clustered around them and so what they're doing is they're communicating to those bees how far away that nectar source is in what direction it is and they'll also share a little bit of that uh, nectar so the uh, the bees as they get closer to the source uh, they can smell it and within a few minutes you'll have these other bees going out to the same source finding it coming back and communicating with more bees so that within an hour or so you can have hundreds of bees at a nectar source that was originally found uh, found by one bee and the other type of communication they have is communication uh, inside the hive with chemicals, also known as pheromones. Uh, the queen produces pheromones to let the other bees in the hive know that she's there. She produces pheromones out of her mouth parts and her, her, her foot pads. And this is shared throughout all the bees in the hive. They're constantly licking each other, licking the queen, passing these chemicals around uh, with their mouth parts and with the antennae. So that, for instance, if uh, the queen is not in the hive, if she gets killed or she's removed within half an hour, all the bees in the hive, and it could be as many as 60,000, will know this information. And within a day, they can start to, uh, they'll, they'll start to rear a new queen. And uh, workers also um, uh, brood produce pheromones in order to, to be fed by the workers. The workers themselves produce pheromones. For instance, there's an alarm pheromone if there's a, a uh, danger to the hive. Uh, they'll communicate this by chemicals and, and alert other bees to, to um, defend the hive. Uh, drones produce pheromones on their mating flights to attract uh, the virgin queen. So there's all sorts of communication that's going on in the hive uh, all the time. And I sometimes, uh, I think their, their forms of communication actually are more, <laughs> can be more sophisticated than humans. For instance, you take the city of Vernon, it has about 50,000 bees, the same number of people that you'd have bees in a beehive. If you were to tell five people a phrase and have them pass it on to five other people so that eventually that everyone in the city would know what that phrase was, I doubt if at the very end uh, you'd have a similar phrase and you started with, and I think a lot of people would be left out. Whereas bees, uh, with their communication system, they've developed it over uh, millions of years and it's very sophisticated uh, and very efficient. Now to get to the other part of this uh, topic, how they how bees can be scary. Um, could you bring up the uh, the other slide, Madeline? Okay. Now you have a honeybee down on the left hand corner. You have a, a bumblebee to the right. And in the middle, you have uh, other types of uh, stinging insects. Now, what I found over the years, I've, I've sold a lot of honey at farmers markets and fairs, and people will always tell me that they've been, uh, will tell me their story about being stung. Um, and as I dig a little deeper, I usually find out that they weren't stung by a honeybee, they were stung by one of these other insects. Now, honeybees are different in that they have barbed stingers, so that when uh, the honeybee stings, uh, uh, an intruder or a human, the barb actually comes out, the stinger comes out along with the venom sac and the venom sac will keep, it'll keep actually keep pumping and the bee will eventually die. Uh, these other bees, including the, um, uh, the bumblebee, they don't have barb stingers so that they can sting repeatedly. So it's an, you know, I encourage you to observe bees in your backyard um, if you do, what I would suggest is that if you wear a hat, if you have long hair, you, uh, you tie your hair back and just kind of observe what they're doing and where they're going. Uh, these other insects, they're a little more problematic. Um, sometimes they can be more aggressive when they're on their own, whereas honeybees, they're just doing their work. They tend to be more defensive around the hive. Um, you don't want to step on a bee or wasps. You're likely to get stung. You have to be careful in the fall if you have sugary drinks. Um, but in case you do get stung, uh, what I would suggest, if it's a honeybee sting, you just scrape it out with your fingernail. Um, if it's one of these other insects, they can sting repeatedly. Uh, they don't leave a stinger uh, in your skin, but the reaction can be very similar. There can be localized swelling. So I would suggest um, uh, putting a cold compress on it, washing it with soap and water first, putting a cold compress on it. It's not unusual to have localized swelling. 
if it's more serious, some people have a, an anaphylactic reaction to a bee sting, in which case they should have an EpiPen. Um, but that's very uncommon. It's only about 5% of the population will have a, a, a really bad reaction to a bee sting. It's actually much more common among beekeepers' families than it is among the, uh, among the general public. Um, what else? Um, as beekeepers, because we go into colonies, we tend to get stung more. We're actually going into the house, we're pulling out frames, we're disturbing them. So we tend to be used to being stung and, and we deal with it either by myself, I wear a hat and a veil. I don't wear a bee suit because I find them uncomfortable. And I don't wear gloves because oftentimes they have to pick up a queen or do things that require a lot of dexterity with my fingers. And it's difficult to do that with gloves. So I tend to take a few more stings that way. It's just part of the job. Um, I take the stinger out. It doesn't bother me that much. And I also use smoke. Beekeepers use smoke to <clears throat> cover up that um, alarm pheromone. We can just put some smoke on the sting and smoke the hive more uh, to calm things down. Um, so I think that I may be getting close to the end here. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, Madeline, we're putting up on the Facebook page some resources. I have a couple of resources to help identify uh, native bees. And then after that, there's um, uh, links to two different beekeeping organizations. One's provincial and one's local. If you want to find uh, more information or if you want to attend a beekeepers meeting, um, they would be good places to start. I think that's about it, Brian. I'm sure I missed a few things. I'd be glad to answer questions afterwards. All right, I'm uh, thank you so much, Phil. That was wonderful. And there will be a chance to ask questions from Phil, from all of our presenters at the end of the presentation today. Uh, thank you for all of your great comments coming in. We've added into the chat as well, uh, in the comments on the side there, some of these links that, be, uh, that uh, Phil was talking about, if you want more information about bees. Uh, I love some of these strategies we have in there. Someone was mentioning just learning not to panic when you see one. Uh, the one time one landed on them and just stayed on their finger for about five minutes. Just stay calm, and let the bees stick around. And I loved hearing about all the different creatures that you see in your backyards. Uh, skunks, raccoons, garter snakes, morning doves, grasshoppers. Well, I wanted to show you a creature that you're not necessarily going to see in our backyards over here. So, Phil, I'll let you go there. Uh, this... You might even hear him a little bit here. This is a special kind of cockroach called a hissing cockroach. And I do want to stress this one is all the way down from Madagascar. In fact, I'll get a little close-up camera we have on our little friend here. Uh, if you'd like, you can put in the chat if you are pro... Uh, whoops, I'm just going to get myself lined up here. There we go. Uh, if you like cockroaches and bugs and insects of all kinds, uh, you can either put a check mark up or a yes or something there. If you're a little less comfortable with these kind of creatures, you can maybe put a, a no or a check down. But insects of all kinds have similar features. Uh, you'll see just like the bees that Phil was talking about, my little friend the cockroach here has six legs. It's got three body parts going along. The little hissing it was doing, uh, this particular species, they'll sometimes hiss if they're trying to scare away a predator or if they're trying to attract a mate, they're trying to say, hey, how's it going? Come on over here. Uh, the other thing you'll notice that's a bit different on this species of insect. Some insects will have wings, some insects won't. I'm just gonna pop that one back inside here. We'll let our little cockroach friend go down there. Because on the subject of wings, uh, we have a very special scientist to join us right now. Uh, this is a specialist in mammals who have wings. Uh, he has over 60 years of in-depth knowledge and experience studying these amazing creatures. Uh, we wanted to welcome from Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation, Dr. Merlin Tuttle. Hey, Merlin. Hi, Ryan. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to present bats as animals we should all love. Oh, I love that. Bats are fantastic. I, I've had a few opportunities to see them in the wild here in British Columbia, and it's always a special treat. Well, very shortly, we're going to see an incredible diversity of fabulous animals. And I think once you've seen them, you'll understand why I love them.
Merlin, I'm curious that your introduction, you mentioned it's been 60 years you've been studying. How old? Teenager in high school. And what first attracted you to them? I was simply fascinated by the fact there was so little known about them. There was a bat cave not far from my home and the uh, bats there were, the, I looked them up in a book and found that they were gray bats and the book said that they didn't migrate, that they lived in one cave year round. But at the cave I was watching, they only came in the spring and fall. I thought, well, they must be migraine. So I got my mother to take me to the Smithsonian and talk with the people who wrote the books. And they were impressed with my observations. So they gave me some bat bands. I banned them and ended up finding these bats migrate long distances in an incredible array of behavior. That is awesome. Just starting as a teenager and exploring the science in your backyard. Uh, I think we've got some images ready to pop up here. Yes. And we'll get that there for you. All okay. Right. Why we should love bats. They're incredible animals, about as fascinating as you can get. They come in amazing diversity from yellow winged bats in equatorial Africa to butterfly bats from Southeast Asia, snow white ghost bats from Latin America. And this idea that bats are ugly is complete rubbish. Look at this. This bat's just as cute as any panda I ever saw. And how about this little gal? And even bats with strange faces can be cute. They're truly incredible. They get excited at mealtime, just like our puppies and kittens at home. And I know we've most of us heard at some point that bats are supposedly blind. Uh, they all have perfectly good eyesight. Some have absolutely superb night vision. Each one has its own unique IQ and personality, just like our friends do. They can have rather strange faces, some more like dinosaurs. Those strange faces are part of the world's most sophisticated navigation systems. Bats like this are sending out beeps of sound and using special apparatus to record the echoes coming back. Uh, how about this guy for a dinosaur equivalent? Anybody who likes dinosaurs should love this guy. Bats like this were around back in the age of dinosaurs. And unlike the dinosaurs, they were sophisticated enough to survive and are still with us today. This guy's long nose leaf, sort of like nose leaf, can aim his sound transmitted from his nose to target tiny insects. How about this guy for a strange animal? We know very, very little about bats. That's part of what makes them so incredibly fascinating. You can make new discoveries about bats right in your own backyard. Most of our bats have been very little studied. And in fact, bat biologists are discovering new species all the time. If you're having trouble getting a custom to this kind of a strange face, perhaps you'll relate better to a jolly good fellow. Bats, yes, can have cheek pouches they can fill with food, just like chipmunks. They can inflate those same pouches to make a sexy call to attract a female. Uh, I'm sure at least some of you have heard that bats are supposedly so ugly people can't appreciate them. Well, I would differ with that idea. These are the four most widespread bats of North America, and I don't think there's anything ugly about them. They're actually quite handsome, and they're incredibly sophisticated. They form long-term friendships. They travel together. They help each other. They share information. Some even adopt orphans, and Little bats that weigh no more than a 25 cent piece can actually live sometimes more than 40 years. That's like a hundred year old human still being able to run sprints through an obstacle course. They live in a wide variety of kinds of places. A lot of them live in woodpecker holes and other cavities and snags. Some blend perfectly with the foliage and trees and roost right among the leaves. Others in tropical areas cut large leaves to form tents that shield them from the rain. 
And believe it or not, there's actually a bat living in Barneo that lives in pitcher plants. Pitcher plants are famous for eating whatever enters, be it insects, some of them even eat rats. And yet there's a special pitcher plant in, in Barneo that specializes in attracting bats to live in it and it feeds off the bat droppings instead of eating the bats. These kinds of discoveries are still being made. This was a discovery made just a couple of years ago. And some of you may be interested to know that uh, some of the finest bat researchers out there are women. This young lady was one of the discoverers of bats living in pitcher plants. Scientists who study bats have all kinds of fun going to neat places looking for bats. Here we're looking, photographing bats living in a termite nest in a tropical rainforest. This may not be your cup of tea roping off cliffs looking for bats. I kind of enjoy it. The bat that I was looking for this particular day is an incredible animal. Spotted bats live from Mexico to Canada. They live in the southwestern part of Canada. They have pink translucent ears that are as long as the head and body. They have a beautiful design of black and white angora-like fur. They are, you know, it's hard to think of an, a mammal in America that's more spectacular than this bat. It may come as a big surprise. It does for a lot of people to find that bats are incredibly intelligent and can be trained. I've trained them to do all kinds of things. I've even trained bats that I didn't actually capture, trained them in the wild. We scientists also get to play sometimes with incredible is equipment. Here scientists are using a helium-filled balloon to carry recording equipment thousands of feet up in the sky and they're going to follow it and monitor it with a mobile radar unit. They used this in order to discover what bats were doing way high in the sky where scientists couldn't get to actually observe them. What they found was these free-tailed bats were traveling thousands of feet above ground to intercept migratory moths. These moths are horrible, costly pests that cost American farmers more than a billion dollars annually. And our bats, are flying up there and intercepting the egg-laden moths. One bat in one night can eat enough of these moths to prevent them from laying 20,000 eggs on crops. Just in our state in Texas alone, it's estimated that these bats are worth more than a billion dollars annually in saving farmers from having to spray pesticides. Bats don't just eat moths, they control beetle pests, grasshoppers, even mosquitoes. One bat can catch a thousand mosquitoes in a single hour. If you hate mosquitoes, you better love bats. We hear a lot about rainforests, but we often don't hear about the fact that rainforests are heavily dependent upon healthy bat populations. Bats play key roles in pollinating hundreds of kinds of unique rainforest trees. Here I'll share with you one that I think everyone will recognize. This is a wild banana from the rainforest of Southeast Asia. Bats were the primary pollinators of wild bananas. We probably wouldn't have domestic bananas today were it not for bats and the wild ancestors of our modern bananas. Here we have a bat in Jamaica about to take an almond fruit. It'll carry the fruit away, drop the seed, and hopefully a new plant will grow. In Africa, we often hear of famines caused by desertification. That may sound like a big word, but it's really just talking about how when we clear forests and don't replant them, we often get desert-like conditions with very little rain and little growing there. But in Africa, it's been found that bats like this can account for 95% of the first seeds dropped in abandoned farmland that result in regrowth of forests. Now, if that's not enough, I, I can understand that you might assume that bats would be diverse and important in a rainforest, but how about deserts? 
if possible, bats are maybe even more important in deserts. All the way from Arizona to Chile, bats pollinate many kinds, dozens of kinds of huge cacti. All the cacti you see in this picture are pollinated by bats. Some bat pollinated cacti get up to 50 feet tall. There are hundreds of species of agave plants also that are pollinators by bats. This one is obviously doing about to do a great job of pollinating an organ pipe cactus flower. This one is about to take the fruit of a famous saguaro cactus. All told, go to a tropical fruit market and you'll find that over 70% of the fruits that we humans depend on are coming from plants that originally depended upon bats for pollination or seed dispersal. Just a few of those that we know best, bananas, plantain, peaches, dates, figs, cashews, avocados, mangoes. There's an almost endless variety of fruits that we benefit from because of bats. But unfortunately, what we mostly hear about bats is that they're supposedly dangerous, horrible carriers of dread diseases. But you know, those are gross exaggerations. As Brian already explained, I've been studying bats for more than 60 years worldwide, often surrounded by literally millions of bats in caves. I've never in my life been attacked by a bat. I've never been bit except by se in self-defense if I was handling a bat that was frightened. And I've never contracted a bat disease. I've contracted some pretty serious ones from other humans in my travels, but never from bats. And we have the perfect test case where I live in Austin, Texas. When more than a million bats began moving into newly created crevices in a downtown bridge, health officials warned that they were mostly rabid, would attack, and were dangerous. Well, that's just not true. And I first went to Austin to explain that to people, and I'm very proud that we were able to save the bats and when I convinced the bat people that they didn't have to fear bats and that they could be really valuable, here's what happened. Austin is now a world center for educating people about the value of living safely with bats. These bats are such a spectacle. They attract people from all over the world. Millions of people have visited Austin just to see and appreciate our bats. They the bats bring in millions of tourist dollars every summer. They control tons of insect pests every night. So in conclusion, what do we learn about bats? They don't attack people. Unless you pick up a sick one and get bitten in self-defense, you have nothing to worry about. They, no matter how strange they may look, are actually incredibly sophisticated. In fact, the stranger they look, the more sophisticated probably. And even ones like this little guy here are uh, can, can be really cute. They pollinate flowers. They're the most efficient long distance dispersers of pollen in the world. They control incredible numbers of insect pests in North America alone. In fact, the U.S. alone, they're estimated to be worth approximately $23 billion a summer in controlling insect pests and reducing the number of pesticides we have to use. I point out to people that every time we kill another bat, we just become that more reliant on pesticides that are already seriously threatening our health and our environment. Finally, they carry seeds that keep the rainforest healthy. And I think you've got plenty of reasons now to love bats. If I had more time, I'd give you a whole bunch more. But I hope you'll go to my website at merlintuttle.org. And there you can look at hundreds of species of bats, thousands of photographs, doing anything you ever imagined a bat could do. And I've taken those photos so that each of you can learn to appreciate bats in your own way. And I hope that some of you will one day want to be true bat researchers. It's a great field of wide open for research. And even if you don't decide to do that, let me assure you that there are plenty of opportunities for private citizens to help learn about bats. We organize trips annually 
in which people come and work for a couple of weeks in the field, helping scientists gather data. We make all kinds of neat discoveries and we'd welcome your participation. I'll be happy to participate with Phil and AJ later in answering any questions you have. Thank you so much, Merlin. That was awesome. Uh, it's neat to see all the parallels between the bats and the bees, like how much pollination happens, how much they're misunderstood going back and forth. Uh, I'm seeing already some great questions coming up in the chat. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to add them in there. We're going to get our whole team back at the end of the presentation and answer the different questions that you might have. Thank you again, Merlin. We are now going to be ready for our next guest. Uh, they're actually based here in Vancouver. Uh, they've been working on a new app. It's actually his son who helped develop it. Uh, the app is used to help to find and recognize different bird species. But there's also an upcoming app called Find the Bats. So please welcome AJ Dalla. Hello, how are you doing, everyone? Yes, my name's AJ, and I'm the executive director of a new nonprofit based here in British Columbia. And what we do is we create free, free to play, free to download, no purchases, none of that stuff, uh, to download educational mobile games. So you can go to the Google Play, the App Store, and search there, and you can download them, play them anytime. And the great thing about that is it's like a, it's a bridge from your, the screen of your phone to going outdoors from screen time to green time, going out in your backyard, just like what this uh, event's all about. And we started off with our first game, which was uh, on the next slide, which is find the birds. And um, basically, and we'll go to the next slide now. There we go, findthebirds.com. So again, like uh, Merlin was talking about and uh, Phil, birds as well. Are pollinators and they're important for insect control and if you use all these animals at their best abilities you don't need all these toxic chemicals and, and toxic chemicals are causing major problems around the world for the environment for humans and we just don't need them when we have a natural ecosystem with these animals which we really need to depend on and appreciate so basically you know go to the uh, store and these games are COVID safe so we're having a problem with COVID now you can't go to these big events just like this virtual event, you can just download, you can learn. And it's also zero carbon. So you're not gonna pollute by pl playing these games. And I'll go to the next slide now. So here you always a shot of a simulated environment. So these are games, they're not apps. They're games where you download it to your phone and then you go in there and it's like you're outside, but you're playing on your phone, walking around, you become the character and you can look for birds, you can look at the re realistic trees, everything is very accurate. We have scientists from the Cornell lab for our bird animations, photographs, videos, and things like that. And basically you're exploring like this realistic habitat in our new location, British Columbia, at Sawmill Lake in the Okanagan Valley. So check that out. We'll go to the next slide. So here's an example of the realism. This is a black-footed albatross. And you can see if you've ever seen one, which you'd be lucky to, because you need to take a boat out into the Pacific Ocean to see one. But on your phone, you could see a simulation, just like we have in our game, and take a simulated boat trip. And you can see the beauty of these birds with their magnificent wingspans. And, and they just, they, they hardly ever land. There's always flying out there in the ocean, just tremendous. And we'll go on to the next slide. So, you know, what are we talking about? Birds, bats, you know, now we've got a new game we're just working on now called findthebats.com. And, and me and my son, who um, the host mentioned earlier, we were down in Arizona and we were looking for birds. We we're doing some research actually on this bird here, the California condor, which is very endangered, critically endangered, the California condor. And we were like walking around and we went to this bridge and, and we were looking around like, is that a bird? And, and we looked closer and it wasn't a bird. It wasn't a plane, that's for sure. Too small. It was a bat. And then we were like, wow, like, why don't we make a game about bats called Find the Bats? Just like Find the Birds. Why not? So that's what we're doing right now. Next slide, please. So, and we're very fortunate, as you just met Merlin, who is the expert on bats. I mean, that guy knows more about bats than I know about breathing. Let's put it that way. So we're very lucky to have Merlin Tuttle and his bat conservation organization. Merlin Tuttle's bat conservation, supporting us, providing photos. And we're even going to have a caricature of Merlin walking around in the, the game, which is not quite launched yet, but we're working on it right now. And he'll be walking around in the game, teaching kids and even adults if they want to play about accurate information about bats. Next slide, please. 
So basically, you'll travel around the globe on a solar-powered ultralight, good for the environment, going to different places like Zambia, Thailand, and the United States, such as Texas. Next slide. And you'll be going to realistic places like this cave in Thailand. Next slide. Or Texas in the desert, looking for bats this time in findthebats.com. And next slide. And here's an example. You can see quite realistic. I mean, it's not a video, it's not a photograph, but we've been told by many conservationists that our designs and our animations are very accurate that people can realistically look at that and then actually go out in the field and see that animal and go, oh, that's it. And we've had many, many, uh, you know, uh, acclaim and praise for, our, you know, what we try to do and make it accurate and have the locations accurate and have the plants accurate. So we can try to bring that education to people like Merlin, the accuracy so that you're actually learning on your device. It's like, but it's fun, you know, it's fun. Next slide, please. And you can take photographs of the environments and the bats and collect species information cards. With Find the Birds, we've got those informations coming from the Cornell Lab, which are the number one place for bird information. And for the bat game, we're gonna have those photographs and text coming from Merlin. Next one. And you'll be doing conservation quests. You're not just looking at them, you're gonna do quests. And not only are you gonna connect with real conservation groups, through links and logos, such as to Merlin's group, you're gonna do little simulated quests, which are based on the real thing, like going into a pecan farm and placing these bat boxes, which they use, and they're very accurately drawn, as you can see here. And that what that does, it tracks bats to the farm. And as Merlin pointed out, there's species in the world of bats that help with pollination and help with pest control. Next slide, please. And here's another bat we have. This is the one down in Texas that I was mentioning about. This is found in by the millions in the giant colony in Bracken Cave. So we'll have Bracken Cave in the game. So you're really going to learn, you know, adults as well. You're going to learn a lot. Next slide, please. There you go, findthebats.com. I encourage you to check out our website. We are fundraising right now. We'd love your support. And check out findthebirds.com, which is ready to play. Thank you very much. Awesome. awesome. Oh, sorry, I just lost my microphone for a moment, but I'm back. Thanks, AJ. That was great. We're going to bring all of our presenters back. Uh, if you have any questions, we can put them on. I'll join your question. Where can I find that game? And we'll put the links up there in the chat for you. Um, Merlin, well, actually, there's one other person we'd like to introduce here. This is Teresa, also from the Merlin Tuttle Bat Conservation. Hey, Teresa. Thanks, Thanks for joining Hi. Uh, I love that so many of the bat researchers are female. Uh, we actually have an event coming up in just a few weeks um, highlighting all kinds of amazing women in STEAM careers. Uh, that's on November 6. Uh, if any of you are interested in registering, we'll put that link up in the chat as well. But it's an opportunity to meet 50 different scientists uh, from all kinds of different research fields and give a sense of the fun and amazing work that they do. Uh, Merlin, I wanted to jump back and there was a question earlier. Someone was asking about flying foxes. Have you had any experience with them? Oh, I love flying foxes. They're incredible. There's this family, Terrapodidae, that they all belong to. The smallest one in Australia is so small that you could hide it in your closed hand. But the big ones have almost six foot wingspans. Very cool. And they tend to be very handsome, attractive bats. They get their flying fox name because of their fox-like faces. They're incredibly important seed dispersers and pollinators. Most of the most economically important trees of Australia are benefiting from these bats' pollination or seed dispersal. And yet, these bats are really seriously endangered. Some have already gone extinct. Uh, please, if any of you do have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I know that we're just with the nature of a YouTube broadcast, we're about four or five seconds ahead of you. So we will wait for them to catch up as we go. Phil, I loved your description of the waggle dance that uh, the bees do out there. I thought that was a great way if I was meeting people at a restaurant to be able to show like everybody just you know, like that. get in there. Um, are, Phil, I had a question. Are, is there a standard size for a bee colony or what's the number of bees you would normally find? Well, beekeepers, um, what we tend to do is just keep expanding the nest size so that um, the bees have more room to raise young and also to store honey. Uh, so 
probably the maximum number of bees you'd have in a hive in a case like that would be maybe 60,000. Uh, feral colonies or, or bees that are, for instance, in a tree, um, their size is limited by the cavity. So okay. they would tend to be uh, have fewer bees in them. And so that would make them uh, swarm more often. Bees tend to, when they get to a certain size, the colony will reproduce by swarming. So as beekeepers, we try to keep the, the bees in the hive um, and prevent swarming. But a, uh, a colony that's um, a feral colony that's living in a tree, for instance, when they reach the point where they don't have any more uh, space, so it'll probably be a smaller, probably wouldn't have 50 or 60,000 bees. It might be smaller. Then they would tend to split off um, uh, and, and half of them would leave to find a new location. And, and then the old colony would raise a new queen. Okay. Uh, the question for you, AJ, people are wondering how long until find the bats is available. Do you have a timeline when they might be able to play the? Yes. Well, I'd love to have it out tomorrow, but unfortunately it takes our animators and programmers a long time. We have a team of about six and uh, you know, it's pretty intense. It's full, full game design and production, but we're a nonprofit. So, you know, working at the fundraising now, we've got some art, check out the website and you know, I would love to have it. I think realistically, probably it's going to come out in, you know, sometime in the early in the new year if we're if we get things going well. Yeah. Okay. We were talking earlier with Teresa and Merlin about some of the places you've been to study bats. Uh, can you let our audience know where are some of the places you've been in the world to look for bats? Sure. Well, bats are located on every continent except uh, Antarctica, and Merlin's been to all of those places. Um, not every country, but every continent. And most recently we went to Ecuador in 2020, in February. And just before that, we went to Thailand. And in other recent years, we've been to Panama and Trinidad, and Costa Rica. Um, but we provide our resources for people worldwide all the time and doing exhibits and projects. And you can you know, go to our website and download them for whatever projects. and. Um, AJ and Adam's game, Find the Bats, is one of those projects that we're really excited to be helping them with and um, having them using our photos. Merlin, do you have a favorite place that you've been? <laughs> That's a really tough one to answer. I've had so much fun in so many places, seeing so many incredible bats that it's really hard to pick one. <laughs> I used to think that the carnivorous bats were super intelligent and so I thought they were more fun to work with than the others. But just a few years ago, I found that these little tiny woolly bats in Borneo that weigh less than a nickel are also incredibly intelligent. <laughs> and I, I just love to study and photograph bats anywhere where there are plenty of them around. Sadly, a lot of the places where I photograph bats, there aren't any more bats are among the most endangered mammals in the on our planet but uh, i certainly like to go to the places where there's still plenty of them around and uh, some of those places i very much enjoyed botswana i love the diversity of panama uh, i had a great time photographing bats a few years ago in bulgaria those sound like uh, amazing places there it's, it's really there. easy to say <laughs> <laughs> to list off cool sounding places because bats are just everywhere um uh, i wanted to hop in uh, aj uh we've had two or three of our guests who have already don't downloaded find the birds so there yeah you know, i saw that in the chat that's tremendous yeah. tremendous thank you very much uh we have time for just a couple more questions phil we we're talking about endangered bats there was a question are bees endangered um Honeybees actually aren't endangered. Uh, native species of bees are because they're losing their habitat. They're subject to uh, uh, to pesticides. Um, honeybees, there are bees lost every year. Most of them are lost to a parasitic mite uh, that was not uh, uh, our honeybee was was not a source uh, was not a host for those mites. It was an introduced mite from another species. So okay. our European honeybee hasn't developed resistance to it yet, but we can always raise more queens and uh, increase the number of hives. In fact, the number of hives in North America has increased, uh, not decreased. 
Um, but that takes energy. So instead of producing honey or pollinating, beekeepers are spending more time raising replacement hives. Right. Um, it's mainly our native pollinators we, we have to be concerned about their losses. Uh, we have one last question here. Uh, I guess this will be for Teresa and Merlin. People were curious if they want to try and study bats in the wild, where are some good places to look for them? Well, the vast majority of bat species are located in equatorial tropical areas. Uh, there are many places to look for bats quite aside from do, you know, conducting major research. Uh, people that stay in resort hotels in the tropics, often there'll be banana plants as ornamentals in the, in the yard. And if you see flowers on those banana plants, there's a very good chance that if you wait a little bit after, you know, in the first half hour or so after sundown, <clears throat> you may see bats coming to pollinate those flowers. You can also look in your own backyard. Right. <laughs> They're, they're everywhere and uh, you can look online and see what bats are available, you know, that live in your area and um, using a echolocation bat meter, you know, you can listen for them because sometimes you can't see them because they fly high and fast and it's dark. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I want to thank all of our guests today, uh, Phil, AJ, Teresa, Merlin. Uh, I think we've learned a lot about these backyard creatures, the ones that we don't need to be scared of anymore. Uh, if you're interested in other upcoming events happening at Science World, scienceworld.ca slash today slash events. We'll pop that up in the chat. Thanks for joining us and enjoy your own backyards, everybody. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for listening. Yeah.